Te rikoto te whara o Aotearoa Unitarians. Te rikoto nā manuhiri no mai haramai ki tēnei hui topa a te atua. Te rikoto tēna tato katoa. Whether you are here because worshipping with us is part of your routine or whether you feel like the cracks in our world are ready to crumble, making it impossible to return to normalcy. On this morning, we gather to proclaim that we belong to one another and that others belong to us. Broken hearts are welcome here. Anxious spirits are welcome here. Minds worrying faster than a racing engine, uncertain what to think. Stubborn egos that sometimes trip us up, cementing us to opinions. Fragile, shell-shocked souls. They are welcome here. Yours, mine, and everyone else's. Not because this community will fix it, through easy solutions or the right way forward. As a liberal religious congregation, we have something far more fragile and far more powerful than that, our need to be together, our need to connect to the life-giving source that moves within and among us, and our need to make one another a little bit braver and wiser before returning to the service of life. My opening words are uh, from a book by Robin Wall Kimmerer entitled Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants. Even a wounded world is feeding us. Even a wounded world holds us, giving us moments of wonder and joy. I choose joy over despair, not because I have my head in the sand, but because joy is what the earth gives me daily, and I must return the gift. If you have a chalice or a candle to light, it's time to light it. As we light this candle and watch it begin to disappear, may we never forget that when all else seems lost, it is time to trust impermanence. Our opening song is I Remember Everything. It was the last song written and recorded by country folk singer John Prine before succumbing to COVID in 2020. Let's move to a song. One of my favorite singers and songwriters, which I came late to know about, but many of you probably have known for years, is Nina Simone. And I want to play uh, a song called Everything Must Change. My reading for today. Actually, are two readings, but they're related. The first is a poem by Robert Graves entitled Flying Crooked. The butterfly, the, the cabbage white, his honest idiocy of flight will never now it is too late 
master the art of flying straight. Yet has, who knows so well as I, a just sense of how not to fly. He lurches here and here by guess and God and hope and hopelessness. Even the aerobotic swift has not his flying crooked gift. And now, second reading is kind of a meditation on this poem entitled The Idiocy of Flight by Jane Rainey Rezepka. Robert Graves' poem speaks of butterfly. Their honest idiocy of flight, lurching here and there by guess and God and hope and hopelessness. Any number of quotations sound this way, and so I think do we, but privately. Publicly, we speak the civilized language of human beings who have things under control. No idiocy, no lurching. The world sees that we function well and happily. Other people believe it. And even we begin to believe it. Life moves forward as always. Privately, though, we experience long stretches of turbulence and the occasional sudden downdraft. So many feel alone when things go poorly at home, when they feel their age, whatever it is, and when they grieve. So many feel alone in their money worries or career problems. Awful life situations seem to set us apart from one another. Normal lives include these awful parts. They don't always show from the outside. It's hard to believe any other folks who join us here from afar and near are feeling the same kind of screaming pain or emptiness or entrapment or panic or precariousness or low-grade worry. Lives, even lives well lived, don't stay in place for long. At least that's how it seems from the peculiar vantage point of the minister's study. So it helps, I think, to accept the idiocy of flight, the butterfly flight pattern so firmly implanted in the human mind and heart. Let the lurching then be no surprise and know we're all up there flying every which way together. I loved the title of her musing, The Idiot Flight of Butterflies. So that's the title of my musing this morning. Think back two and a half years ago to the day before you heard of corona, coronavirus breaking out in Wuhan, China. Whatever that was like for you, that was normal. For me, I was a newlywed. I had not even learned what that new normal meant for me yet. I certainly hadn't anticipated that we would spend most of two and a half years sheltering in place, just the two of us with Waldo for company. Discovering that our normal discovering what our normal was. So when I hear someone longing for life to return to normal, I'm not sure what their normal is. 
Perhaps I should focus on knowing the future instead. Irony, apparently, is my forte. In my preparation for this music, I found myself on the Merriam-Webster website where I found a reflection on normalcy. In the perpetually uncertain times in which we and everyone else who have ever existed live, it could be reassuring to feel that you have some tiny bit of knowledge about which you are sure. I may not know if I'll have a job at this point next month, but at least I know that U.S. President of the 1920s, Warren Harding, coined the no word normalcy with a deep and abiding sense of regret we at miriam webster must inform you that your sense of order in the world is misplaced no we do not know whether you will have a job next month but we can state with certainty that warren harding did not coin the word normalcy Warren G. Harding, who was America's most corrupt president until Nixon and Trump came along, adopted this mathematical term for describing the distribution of a bell curve in the presidential election of 1920. In his stump speech, he stated that he was for normal times and a return to normalcy. A return to normalcy soon became the slogan most identified with this campaign to the considerable chagrin of many who felt that normalcy was either a corruption of normality or simply a non-existent word. A columnist spoke for many when he wrote, the friends of Senator Harding are defending his language now by saying that normalcy is a perfectly good word. Well, so is Jack Asitical. When I apply it to verbiage, fantastic verbiage. So what is normal anyway? When will things return to normal? And what will a no new normal look like? Tom Frieden at the beginning of the pandemic suggested, it's tempting to wonder when things will return to normal, but the fact is that they won't. Not the old normal anyway, but we can achieve a new kind of normality, even if this brave new world differs in fundamental ways. By this standard, the old normal is one in which our health care systems and governments are not prepared to deal with things like COVID-19. The new normal, in contrast, is mostly like the old normal, except in this one. We are ready for global pandemics. The new normal, in other words, changes what was wrong but keeps what was right with the old normal. But why did we call it normal if the old normal was wrong? Similarly, if the new normal differs from the old one, how can we pretend we're still dealing with normal? The word normal appears straightforward now. But like many of our words, as soon as we begin thinking about it, it starts to fall apart at the seams. As sociologist Alan Horwitz points out in his journal article, Normality, the dilemma that normality forces upon us is that in most cases, no formal rules or standards indicate what conditions are normal. In the absence of such rules, those who wish to identify normality will typically turn to one of three different definitions. The first is the statistical view, where 
the normal is whatever trait most people in a group display. Normal is what is typical, what most people do, which means it is impossible for any individual to be normal. The trouble with seeing normal statistically is that it may trick us into accepting widespread phenomena as good. A majority of Nazis, Germans, Nazi Germany citizens, Horowitz notes, supported the policies of racism and genocide in the 1930s and 40s. Was Nazism then a normal philosophy for humans to hold? The second way of defining normal, says Horowitz, is some sort of ideal. And this definition comes through the words etymology. In Latin, norma refers to a carpenter's square, which assisted tradies in establishing a perfect right angle. The norm provided a concrete standard that, if followed, allowed the user to reproduce a specific pattern. Nazi, Nazism may have been widespread in Germany, but it was not normal because it did not live up to the ideal society we wish to achieve. On the other hand, random acts of kindness, even when they are in short supply, might be seen as normal in an aspirational sense. We want compassion to be a guiding norm in our society. The third definition looks to evolutionary science and defines normality in terms of how humans are biologically designed by natural selection to function. What is normal for a human being then is all those behaviors that make it fit to thrive in its particular niche. The capacity to feel shame when, betray, when betraying a loved one is normal in this scheme, as is the desire for one's offspring to survive. The three definitions of normality, statistical, aspirational, and functional, often end up sliding into each other during everyday conversation. This collapse is evident in many of our discussions about what the new normal will look like once COVID-19 is under control. The new normal will mean that statistically, most of us will go back to most of what we were doing before the pandemic struck. But with the aspiration that our societies will make changes for the better, Will, which will end up functionally being good for the survival of our communities. So we kind of want to return to where we were, but we also don't. We want things to be the same, but we also want them to be different. We want to return to normal, but we know deep down that our journey won't be a return so much as a departure. The definition of normal might be hard to pin down, but its function is pretty straightforward. Normal is safe. It's familiar. In the aftermath of the devastation of World War I, Warren Harding's U.S. presidential campaign promise was simple. America's present need is not hero heroics, but healing, not nostrums, but normalcy. Hardy knew Americans wanted to get back to life as they knew it before war disrupted the flows and rhythms of their daily lives. He understood that in the face of fear, people longed to return to a time before the fear set in. Hardy and his supporters were, we might say, nostalgic for the normal, just like we are. 
Nostalgia comes from two Greek words, nostos, meaning homecoming, and algia, meaning longing. Rose, that's for you. To be nostalgic is to long for home. Swiss doctor Johannes Hoffer first coined the term in his dissertation in 1688 to define the sad mood originating from the desire to return to one's native land. Hoffer believed his patient's malady was that they longed for their homes. Nostalgia was originally a longing for a different place. Eventually, it became a longing for a different time, specifically for a time that never existed. Nostalgia, writes Svetlana Boyan, is a romance with own, one's own fantasy. In Logging for Paradise, Jungian analyst Mario Giacobbe explores the human propensity to idolize a past normality that never existed. We project backward into the golden twenties, the belle epoque in Paris, or life before the fall. The world of wholeness exists mostly in retrospect as a compensation for the threatened, fragmented world in which we live now. It is my position that there is no such thing as normal, except in mass. There is only our present reality, which is different from the one we exited, and different from the one that comes next. We are like Gray's cabbage butterfly, as we leave one only to enter a new one. We do so erratically. We have exhibited little grace or aptitude, but still we flutter on. Look at how we worship together now, as opposed to how we did when first entering lockdown. I remember struggling to find ways to make it feel like what we had done for years. Slowly, I began experimenting with first the available technology and later with new approaches in the order of service, music, and what I used to call sermons. Introducing opportunities to reflect on the topic in small groups. We began having meetings, circle groups, and classes online. New ways to stay in touch with each other were offered. At first, we hung on to in-person worship and distant worship until new rules for gatherings were issued. While many of us are zoomed out by our work life, many still find the will to join us and something unpredictable has happened. We've become a national and then international congregation, bringing new voices into our common life. I don't think our new reality is fully formed yet. We have certainly not normalized it, but we will keep fluttering on for the journey is what worship is about, not the destination. For our closing song, I've chosen a song from that good old religion, but because the language in it will cause Unitarians to have a stroke. I've, I've chosen just a musical version of it that is quite lovely. And if you know the words, you might overcome your chat, the theological challenge they present for us. Uh, 
and do some theological gymnastics and find them kind of helpful as we attempt the idiocy of science. The song is Blessed Assurance, played on a tenor sax. My closing words, all that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. The spirit of life is change. And now, let us extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Our, our questions for today or what normality do you miss in your life? How have you coped with impermanence? I'll repeat that. What normality do you miss in your life? How have you coped with impermanence? 